Hello and welcome on The Watchers TV, welcome at The Watchers Club and today we have a special guest uh, with uh, Julien Tornard, CEO of Zenith and we're going to talk about some new watches uh, uh, released by uh, Zenith but also a little bit on the, the business side of things because indeed we're uh, facing a rather awkward situation. Uh, so Julien, tell us about uh, the, the main uh, new watches that uh, you presented. 2019 was such an amazing year for Zenith with all the celebration around the El Primero. Uh, it's been a great year for Zenit, and 2020 should have been an incredible year. Unfortunately, should have been because with the crisis, nobody is going to do a record year this year. But it's just postponed to the future. And we had quite a few launches. Uh, first in Dubai, where we had uh, beautiful novelties. And of course, then now, Basel being cancelled, we are launching mostly online uh, different watches. And I think today we're going to talk about two of them. The Shadow. It's actually uh, a micro-blasted titanium uh, A384, for people who know it, small size, 37, uh, in a beautiful way. That's basically a revival of a watch that was kind of forgotten in our attic for all those years and that we found uh, a year and a half ago. And going to something a bit smaller, is it going also with the trend of things right now? Not in particular, even if it's a good point, because I, I believe that uh, in such crises and, and after this crisis, people might uh, go for, I would say, less bling bling and more conservative long term product. But I think we're also kind of definitely heading towards a trend where you can still appreciate and you can still purchase luxury, but it doesn't have to be flashy anymore. Absolutely, absolutely. Flashy, I fully agree with you. Then I think brands have a responsibility to continue also to build the future, to continue to bring new things. So tell us a bit about the story story behind uh, this shadow edition, you know, what does it have to do with the history of Zenith? How did it just come into being? There were four prototypes made. On, only four? Only four, in a slightly wider shape, but black, of course, during those days, PVD, uh, but very good looking watch without date, important detail. Um, and basically, uh, there were only four and nobody knew really what they, where, where they were. Uh, we only knew that two of these prototypes had been sold at some point because they were on the secondary market. Uh, we saw one of them on the Hodinkee sale a year and a half ago. We know that one, another one went from uh, auction to auction a few times, but nobody really knew about that. And by coincidence, we found one of them. So the fourth one disappeared. We don't know where it is. But we have one in our manufacture that we found. And we said, OK, this is a beautiful watch. It's been in the shadow of the company for all those years. Let's work on a revival piece and, and, and make, it a, uh, yeah, make it a beautiful contemporary watch out of a vintage model. And that's how it came to, to life, basically. And uh, uh, yeah, I remember very well when we, when we started these discussions. And I'm super happy about the result. And will this piece uh, be part of the collection? Or is it kind of a limited something? Or? Yes, it will be part of the chrono within Chronomaster. You have what I call the revival. Chronomaster Revival, where we give tribute like we did last year for the A386, for the A384, the famous uh, ladder bracelet, the Gefrer bracelet that we launched in Dubai, you know, all these kind of iconic watches. And believe me, there are a lot. Uh, uh, all these iconic watches are putting back on stage uh, in such a way within the revival here. Yeah. And just final question on this uh, shadow, uh, why titanium? Alors, because we wanted the rendering, we wanted to be as close as possible to the original color of that particular watch. And uh, if I had both watches with me, I could show you. Uh, we wanted this black rendering, which was PVD. We didn't want to do PVD today. So the best way to get close and to have a contemporary touch was to go for titanium, microblasted titanium, I should say. So this is a very nice rendering uh, that we decided to go for that watch. So you really have a right balance, as I said, between vintage and contemporary. Uh, it's a super cool watch. I love you like it. it. <laughs> so what about um, a new, uh, another watch? Yes, another one. Oh, this one I'm wearing here. It's also something that's coming out of the treasure, but in a different way. And uh, I remember like yesterday, this was in November, uh, November uh, 2018, just before we uh, work on uh, all the celebrations of the 50th anniversary of the El Primero. Mm -hmm. I was in a meeting and I get a call from uh, two people of my team, Romain Marietta, who you know, uh, who is the head of product, and someone else uh, working on the archives and history. And they were digging up and putting things in order in the attic and they found a very, very tiny little box mm -hmm. uh, in which you had th three or four dials, very old dials. 
You all know the famous dials of the El Primero with the three colors, the three counters, three colors. This is well known. But these dials, uh, they were in quite good conditions and they were three shades of blue, which we found out it had never been commercialized ever. And I said, okay, this is fantastic. Let's work on a story on that because as you know, the manufacturer is super important at Zenit. Mm -hmm. And as you also know, 100% of the Zenit watchers today, they have a Zenit movement. So we put really the manufacturer uh, in top priority. So we said, okay, we were the first brand to open up the visits of the manufacturer to public. Okay, every Friday, except those days due to the, the pandemic situation. But this has been a great success. So this, we found it in the very heart, in the deepest place of the manufacturer, in the attic of Charles Vermont. So let's do this watch as a manufacturer watch. When I say manufacturer watch, it means that this watch will only be available to people who visit the manufacturer. In other words, if in a couple of years you see someone in the plane wearing that particular watch with the three uh, sub-dials in blue, mm -hmm. you know this person has been to the manufacturer. Mm -hmm. I thought it was a very cool tribute to those days, to Charles Vermeau, to all these men who made Zenit in those years, in a, in a different way than just a revival product. I think it was a very nice uh, approach. Mm -hmm. uh, one little exception, as you can imagine these days, of course, manufacturer visits are not possible. And I made, with my team, we made the decision to basically sell this watch on our uh, e-commerce website that's being launched right now. Mm -hmm. uh, as an exception for now, because we cannot let the people in. Mm -hmm. But every single owner will be invited, uh, not forced, but almost, <laughs> to visit the manufacturer and to share some time with me, because I want to show them where we found uh, these dials. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a nice story. and I'm. Honestly, it's been, it's been something we've been working on for a year and a half and I've been so excited about that project. So you were just mentioning before that uh, this particular watch, you can indeed uh, buy yeah. it uh, through yeah. your e-business solutions, which is a good transition to uh, talk a bit more yeah. about business because indeed in this uh, uh, current uh, climate, we see also more brands opening up on the e-business. So what uh, concrete uh, consequences uh, does this situation have on uh, Zenith right now? Alors, we are living some situation that ne nobody ever experienced. I think it's totally crazy. and. Uh, and for the last few weeks, I mean, uh, the whole world was kind of stopped. So when we decided, uh, and we were among the first manufacturer mid-March to close the manufacturer, you know, on 17th of March, we decided to close it. I remember the day after I made two quick decisions. First, I told my executive committee, we are going to talk every single day at 9 a.m. And then I asked them a second thing, how can we digitalize? And this is a big word, but how can we digitalize? as much as possible, all the tasks, all the jobs that you are performing and your teams are performing. Product-wise, we have a weekly product development uh, meeting where we discuss about the product, so we continue to create. And obviously e-commerce. E-commerce, I would say, watching, the Swiss watch industry has not been always the most advanced, you know, and for many years the industry was like, no, it's not for us, it's luxury. So much respect, in a way, for the product that they thought that we would not sell much online. So what I've done is that I, I, I speed up a lot the, uh, the process of um, opening up e-commerce. And that's what I was referring to for the, for the launch of that particular watch. Again, it doesn't su supplement the, the, the physical oh. side of the business, but it complements right. it. Yeah. Exactly. As we've said for a while, you know, between retail and wholesale, uh, e-commerce, I mean, these are different channels. And I think the right approach is an, a balanced omni-channel approach. And on the production side, uh, where do you stand now? Um, so production, as I said, we completely closed the manufacture uh, on March 17th. And of course, for watchmakers and polishers and all the technical jobs, I mean, they couldn't perform any job from home. And uh, 10 days ago, we decided to reopen the manufacture with around 50 people. And now, step by step, we're adding, you know, to be sure that it's safe, to be sure that people are comfortable, but to, to resume production, because we have to. I mean, we have novelties to be produced, to be delivered. Uh, we have a lot to do, so it's, it's very important. But I'm, I'm very happy, and something I can tell you is I was there 10 days ago for the first day, and when I saw the faces of our watchmakers, they were so happy, <laughs> you know. You are never that happy to go back to work on a Monday morning. <laughs> but they had a smile like that, and uh, they told me how much they missed. And some of them, they said, I, I got bored. And uh, uh, because we worked from home, they didn't. So beyond Zenith, what kind of structural changes do you see uh, the industry will face with uh, this situation? 
difficult to say because I wish I knew because nobody really know how uh, business will resume when and it, in which dimension. I personally believe that Europe will definitely take longer to recover than Asia. Having lived myself seven years in Asia, um, what I realize is that when Asians go through crisis, they recover. It's probably linked to the fact that they have this philosophy of time, which we work on. A, we, 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 we Europeans, we believe on a li linear you know, time. So if you miss one moment, you miss one opportunity, it's behind. Asian, they think circle. And circle means that if you miss the opportunity, it will come back. Mm -hmm. So they stay calm and, 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 and positive on that. So I think it's a, it, it might have something to do with this. I'm not sure, but uh, I, I believe Asia will start again quite, uh, quite strongly. Yeah. Well, we definitely hope so. So, Julien, it was a pleasure to have you here. My pleasure. Thank Always you, a pleasure. Suzanne. And uh, well, we wish the industry all the best. Mm -hmm. And again, viva watchmaking. Sure. Thank you. <laughs>